This chapter opens up the concept and topics behind fraud and errors. So we're going to talk a lot about what are some of the ways that people cheat, lie, steal, and then how do we discover that? How do we design systems to prevent that or at least minimize it from happening? So we've got a couple different learning objectives here. We're going to talk about like what exactly fraud is and the different kinds of it. We're going to talk about who does it and why. Then we'll get into computer-specific elements or approaches and then how to deal with that as well. Now, when you look at fraud, there's a ton of really great examples out there of uh, people who have stolen from their companies. So one recent example is Theranos with Elizabeth Holmes. And this one I think is really interesting because Theranos was a blood testing company that said it could look at a couple of drops of blood and then figure out a ton of different tests and medical information from it. This lady and her company were super hot for a really long time. Uh, it's amazing how kind of how long they're able to keep their fraud running when basically it didn't work. And then with her, it's interesting as well because she came from a very uh, well-connected family. They had a ton of very high-level investors working with the company early on, a ton of credibility before it all came sort of plummeting down. We think about like how it kind of came down. Um, this was fairly recent, just a couple of years ago, she was put on trial for fraud. And it's interesting to kind of think like, well, what was going on here? Well, the core purpose of the machine was that it could look at your blood and then give a whole bunch of information on it. And it just, it didn't work. I mean, it was fairly straightforward, actually. And so you think, well, how did this entire company work where they kept the core mission of the company, the core technology, was just not doing what it should have done? And why did it take so long to kind of come out? Well, you can look at two people who are instrumental in kind of calling an end to this fraud. So one of them there on the left, Tyler, uh, he actually was brought on board by a relative who was on the board of directors. So he joined as an intern and started working as a research engineer. So as he was there at Theranos, he realized that there were some things going on with the data and that they were actually running the blood samples in a secret lab, not the actual machines that they said they were using. So he actually told people about this, um, thinking that Holmes didn't know. He actually told her. Obviously, she knew about it, and so it wasn't exactly appreciated. But they started talking to his family, who were on the board of directors and other elements as well, and it really just went nowhere. And the people basically ostracized him, critic, very critical of him, uh, telling him he didn't know what he's talking about, led to breaches in his family, um, before he finally decided to actually contact uh, the the New York State regulators about it, and the Wall Street Journal. And we look at the right, um, we can also see this other lady named Erica. Uh, she was real excited to come work for Theranos as well, um, but she started realizing that some of the outlier tests were being deleted to make sure that the machines passed the quality control. So when she even donated her own blood and then her machine said she's got a problem, which she, she didn't have. So she started realizing that there were some issues about this. So she ended up resigning over her misgivings um, and realizing that this was inaccurate. And the thing is, this was back in 2013 and 2014. So this fraud was actually going on for years and years and years before it actually got kind of blown up and people started realizing all the issues. And the same thing, it's interesting to see with both of them, what happened to them as they saw this fraud. So this is kind of what you guys who are listening to this, who are entry-level employees were run into. If you're in a company, you may find something that doesn't quite seem to match up. And with both of these people, they first went to their supervisors, as you should do. They talked to the company, and the company basically said, hey, you're, you're, you don't know what you're talking about. You're, you're wrong. This is stupid. Um, they started going public with it very late in the process because they were um, pushed by the company and by all these people who said that this, this company was reputable to really doubt themselves. It even got to the point where they were being harassed by private investigators and, and other things. So it's a real interesting story. But both these people had the courage, at least, to sort of respond, even though they were new and even though they were young, to push back against the company narrative. So how bad is crime and how bad is fraud? Well, if you look at the general stats out there, we're losing approximately $3.7 trillion a year in global fraud losses, so a huge amount of money. If you talk to individual companies, you find that most companies have had security breaches. Almost half have been targeted by organized crime, and most have financial losses. So it is super, super common. And one of the things you'll notice, too, is that companies don't exactly advertise this kind of thing. 
So often you'll have losses be covered up and not talked about because no one in the company wants to advertise that they were targeted and hit with something. We also find this inside of the accounting industry as well. You can see if you look at KPMG or other of the big four or other large accounting firms that they're constantly being hit with fines from making mistakes or not going along with what they should be. So it's not just industry, it's also the people who are supposed to be the watchdogs. And we'll have some more examples of that later on. So what are some of the threats here? All right. Well, obviously we talked about some of these already, um, but a big problem with security problems are actually human errors. So this could be back to, if you think about one of our prior chapters, we talked about computer uh, fraud techniques and how you can be attacked by computers. And this is something as simple as clicking on spoofed email is an unintentional human error. We also need to worry about intentional acts and fraud falls more into an intentional piece. So, so what exactly is fraud? Well, fraud requires five key elements here. It requires some kind of false statement. This false statement must have a material fact to induce a person to act. There must be an intent to deceive. The victim, victim must rely upon the misrepresentation and there must be a loss. So you know, let's break this down, right? If you walk into a 7-Eleven, grab a candy bar, and walk out the door, is that fraud? No, that's theft, that's not fraud. Fraud would be if you're the owner of the 7-Eleven going to the bank and saying to the bank, hey, we need a loan to expand when actually you're out of cash. Okay, well, how is that fraud? Well, if I go in and the 7-Eleven's my store and I say, hey, I'm making money, well, that's a false statement. Did that material fact induce or cause the victim, the bank, to give me the loan. Yes, it did. It caused them to give me a loan. Was there an intent to deceive? And this is important, right? Did I know what, what I was saying was wrong? You know, I could have said, hey, I think that the market's expanding. Well, that's, that might be a matter of opinion. I think that this is going to be better. I think everything's going to be okay. But I mean, there's also just straight up lying, right? So there has to be this intent to deceive the person. Does the victim rely upon the misrepresentation? So if the bank relies upon me saying that, hey, my business is making money, and actually I'm losing money like crazy, then yeah, that would be a reliance upon the misrepresentation. And then was loss suffered? So if I pay back the bank, then no loss was suffered. However, if I fail to do it, the bank has loss, and then now I have fraud. Now when I look at fraud, you see this is a massive amount of revenue is lost to fraud. So 5% is, is huge. And this could be a wide range of things, and it's probably not a normal distribution curve or anything like that. Uh, but it is, it's a major thing we need to think about. So let's get into the major categories here. Category one is basically theft. All right, so I am the bookkeeper. I say that I am depositing money in the bank. My boss relies upon that, and actually I put it in my own account. So I've just stolen stuff. And this could be cash, it could be digital stuff. And we're looking at a median loss of about $125,000 and most of the cases are kind of this, this asset misappropriation. This could be, I say inventory was destroyed when I actually stole it. It could be, I said, I went out and I had lunch with a client when I had lunch with uh, my wife instead, uh, all kinds of things. The other kind is fraudulent financial reporting. All right, this is cooking the books. I think this is one that tends to be more upper level. So misappropriation of assets tends to be anybody with access to cash can do that. But fewer people are able to do fraudulent reporting. And this is basically cooking the books. Now, there's been some well-publicized cases of this recently. Um, but basically, it's any time that you lie about the financial status of your business to do something. So say, for example, I own a building. And the building on the open market is worth $10 million. But then I go to the bank and I say, hey, I need a loan from you. And I'll put up my $40 million building as collateral. Well, the bank then relies upon me saying that the building is worth four times what the market says. And it says, okay, well, hey, if we have that collateral, I can give you a very low risk rate on your loan. Now, if I went to the bank and said, hey, I've got a $10 million building, they may say, okay, well, that's great, but that puts you in the high risk category because you're asking for a $10 million loan, your building's worth 10 million, so we might lose money on this one. Versus a $40 million building, ah, bank is fine, bank will not have any problems here. So we see the median loss is actually a lot higher than the misappropriation of assets. 
And these are things like you know, pyramid schemes and investments going bankrupt and all kinds of stuff. But there's, there's a lot of these kind of like high-level frauds with big, big dollar values. We also see that this is a factor in over half of the lawsuits against auditors. So for you personally, if you think about going into auditing, this is something you really need to be thinking about. So let's look at an example of this. Uh, we have this uh, startup. And so this owner went on the Forbes 30 under 30 list for her startup called Frank. And it basically was a way to help students navigate the financial aid process. So this was actually purchased by J.P. Morgan Chase. So I mean, this is a big purchase. This is a high profile company. It's well known out there. And it turned out that she had actually made it up. So if you look at the actual data, uh, she, said she had some, some clients, but then she got a data scientist to make up a couple million of customers. And so this data scientist went in there, simulated a whole bunch of data for her, and then she went to J.P. Morgan Chase and sold her business to him. So it's an interesting case that even well-trained and sophisticated people often can miss things like this. So what are some statistics on fraud? First off, smaller companies are more vulnerable than larger companies. Now, this is kind of counterintuitive. You think with a big company, there's a lot of opportunity for this. The problem with small firms, though, is that they just don't have the resources for proper controls. If you're a small business and you've got one accounting person, it's impossible to segregate custody, authentication, and recording. And so it's easier to steal money from them. We see most of these are not reported to the police. And most cases have some kind of warning behavior. Now, this is why, as an auditor, you should be sensitive to people's financial status. And it seems really invasive to you know, look at the parking lot and see what people drive. But if you see an accounts payable clerk driving a Ferrari, you should be a little bit curious about that. There's other cases where there was a lady who stole a bunch of money from a small town. And she was a fairly mid-level employee, but she had this massive horse farm. And if you know horses at all, you know horses are super expensive. But for some reason, no one ever looked into how this lady was able to afford this massive farm on her little salary, and she got away with stealing millions of dollars from this town. We find that most are first-time offenders, and actually one of our goals as control designers is to catch fraud when it's still small. Frauds tend to get bigger and bigger the longer they go, and you're doing a service to people to actually catch them in their first mistake when it's still a minor offense. We also find that the higher you are in an organization, the more costly the fraud is going to be. So owner executives are four times as expensive as manager's fraud, and manager's fraud is 11 times as costly as employee fraud. So your responsibility as an auditor is to come in and understand this stuff, figure out what the risks are, and then try and figure out how to respond to them. And sadly, our auditors are not doing a great job. As one great example, you can see that EY got slapped with a $100 million fine from the government because its auditors were cheating on the ethics course of the CPA test, which is kind of astonishing here that it's an ethics test. EY knew people were sharing their answers with it and did nothing about it. So I think it just goes to show that if you cheat on an ethics test, there's probably other things you're cheating on as well. So what are the conditions for fraud? We can kind of split it into three general pieces here. Pressure, opportunity, and rationalization. And we can look at these and kind of dive in a little bit and see some great examples of these three elements, pressure, opportunity, and rationalization. So as one example here, we have two guys who pled guilty to trading in securities about Trump's media business. So they had side confidentiality agreements, and they, they took that information and went and traded with them. So how does this fit the conditions for fraud? Well, first off is pressure. Pressure could have been they wanted more money. They weren't happy with the money that they had agreed to. They were living probably above their, above their means. So you can think about you know, personal lifestyle choices or even emotional choices. You want more money. Money means that you're worth something. Uh, money means that you've made it, and so you might be pressured to take that. For opportunity, they were giving confidential information, and so they used that to convert to personal gain. And then often what you'll find is some rationalization. People don't want to think of themselves as bad people. And so they'll often find some way to tell themselves that they're a good person. So let's dive into this. So first off, pressure. 
And I think this is one of those key elements to think about for your own life. Do you do things that open you up to this fraud condition? So pressure. One might be financial. Uh, living beyond your means. Uh, basically, you spend more money than you make. And it sounds crazy, but that's one of the key things you can do to keep yourself ethical is just have some money saved. Try to keep your credit good. Don't spend money you don't have. Pay off your credit card every month. And ultimately, if you aren't making enough money, you have to take actions to fix that. That may be going back to school and getting more certifications. could be changing jobs. But you have to take responsibility for your own life. Secondly, you have emotional pressure. This could be greed, pride, or ego. It might be that your brother or sister makes a lot of money and you feel like you have to match them and to maintain your status or to look good in front of your parents. It could be that you feel like you're not really recognized at your company. Maybe you've worked there for 10 years and no one's ever said thank you and you feel like you're owed something. It could be coercion. It could be your boss saying, hey, if you want to be successful, this is what it takes. Or it could be a lifestyle. Um, gambling is a huge problem these days, and a lot of people get in trouble because they take some money and spend it betting on things. They lose the money, and they go and they steal more money to try and make up those losses and lose that as well, and it kind of escalates from there. Rationalizations. One of the biggest ones is that you're only borrowing the money and you overpay it. And this is easy to rationalize. You say, you know, it's not permanent. I'm just taking it for a week or two. I just need a little bit of money to close up my my uh, rent for the month, and then I'll be okay next month. The problem is that this tends to escalate. You're not taking hard choices to either cut your spending or make more money, and so you tend to repeat this pattern over and over again, and they get worse and worse. Which for a good cause, um, a classic one is, I am very important, I'm above the rules. And this is a big thing for CEOs or chief executives. And this can happen in you know, non-profits or for-profits. It might be that you feel like you're so important to this non-profit that you are worth something more, that the rules don't really apply to you. Well, the company owes it to me. All right? This is rightfully my bonus. I'm just taking it. You can see some more good examples about accountants falling into trouble with PricewaterCooper. So they're looking at this expert called Peter Johns Collins. He's an international tax expert, and he was going to try and help the Australian government get overseas companies to pay their fair share of tax. Unfortunately, he did not go with the confidentiality agreement saying that he wouldn't disclose his information. So he started talking with other people at PwC, which gave them an advantage. So this, on one hand, he's telling the government how they can tax Google, and on the other hand, he's telling his buddy at the firm, who then goes and talks to Google, and says, hey, this is what's coming up. You should change how you're working. So we see all these things come together into the fraud triangle. People have opportunity, they feel pressure, and they rationalize it. So for example, if you look back at Peter Collins, he had opportunity because he had special knowledge that wasn't supposed to be revealed. He probably felt pressure. This could have started very innocently. It might have been in that one of his colleagues at PwC talked to him and said, hey, you know, I hear you're working on this. That's really cool. Tell me more about it. And he felt flattered and honored by that. So I was like, okay, yeah, we're working with this. Got this cool project up. Like, wow, that's so interesting. And it can start very innocently. Like, oh, yeah, I think this is a loophole that should be closed. You're like, yeah, yeah, we're looking at that loophole here. Or it could have get bigger pretty quickly where maybe they come to him and they say, hey, if you're a team player, you're going to give me some heads up on this because I've got a big account. And if we lose this big account, you don't get a bonus. And then it turns into rationalization. It says, oh, well, you know, I'm not really doing anything wrong. I'm just helping out a friend at the firm. Or I'm not really doing anything bad because Google would find out eventually what this is like. So this is something to be careful about in your own life, to look for opportunity to commit fraud, avoid pressure, and then be careful about rationalizing it in your own head because you can very quickly find that you go from being okay to in deep, deep trouble without much effort. So let's, what are, are some ways that you possibly can steal money? So one of the example ways of stealing money is a check kiting scheme. And a lot of different uh, schemes kind of work in the same way here, which relies upon lag time. So we have a scammer writing a check to his bank. So he writes a big check for his bank. And he only has $1,000 in the bank. He deposits it at a second organization and then withdraws money from that organization. And then he writes a bigger check from that one back to the original bank. And basically just sort of looping this money around. And the idea here is that none of the banks yet to quite catch up 
before the money's being moved or given for somewhere else. You can see a similar thing with lapping. With lapping, you have someone receiving money, and they take money and they put it in their account instead of the, instead of the company's account. And then they cover the hole by taking customer B's money and then paying it to the first invoice. And then customer B gets paid with customer C. And so this kind of thing could go on quite a long time. As long as the clerk is able to continually apply the money from one customer to another customer. It tends to go downhill once you have things like mandatory vacation or maybe some kind of automatic reconciliation process. All right, computer. What are computer fraud? Well, anything with a computer is computer fraud, and most fraud is on computers nowadays, so it's kind of uh, self-defining. So how do we catch fraud? All right, the most common way to catch fraud is actually not through auditors. Instead, anonymous tips are typically the number one way that we catch fraud in an organization. And what we see here is that the typical pattern is that someone comes in an organization and gains people's trust. And this is shockingly easy to do. People often have very high charisma and they're very good at getting people to trust them. We want to trust people. We want to think the best of people. And so you have these people that are exploiting that desire to gain your trust in order to steal from you. We find that they falsify records to hide their misdeeds and that this rarely stops on their own. Usually this escalates over time. We also see that this typically is not that they're investing or saving money, instead they're spending the money. And this could be on gambling, it could be on luxuries, it could be on expensive vacations or cars. This is why we want to pay attention to lifestyle. So how can we stop this? Well, one of the first things we do is design an organization that encourages integrity. And this is things like having a strong board of directors, having strong responsibilities. And so there's a lot of examples out there of firms that don't do this. But if you have firms that are excessively focused on growth or performance, uh, firms that don't have solid HR structures or responsibility areas, that's more likely to have a fraud occur. We want to have strong internal controls. This means we segregate accounting functions. We have forms, we have independent checks, there's reconciliations. Uh, we have controls over our computers, we patch systems, we update systems. So there's a lot of just sort of concrete operational things we can do just to make it harder to steal money. We want to make it so we can assess and uh, detect when this is happening. So we should have regular internal and external audits, we should have a fraud hotline, we should do audit trails of transactions. In other words, uh, when you make a change on a system, it doesn't just go in, you actually record that that change has happened. And you have to have systems that are just there to monitor when problems occur. And we want to minimize our losses by having things like insurance and recovery plans, offsite data, and monitors. We can also use fraud analytics to try and see when fraud is happening and how it's working. So nowadays, we have this software that's pretty good at going into a company and assessing problems. Now, it still needs the human component. Um, a lot of time what these will do is actually filter out transactions. They'll say, hey, well, these are transactions are okay, and the remaining ones need to be analyzed. Now, there are some specific techniques we can talk about. One example is Benford's Law. So Benford's Law says that the first digit of a number is much more likely to be one than two, more likely to be two than three, three than four, four to five, and so on. So what you'll find is that if people make up numbers for transactions, they will often choose a random number, and that doesn't apply with Benford's Law. So with Benford's Law, you can actually look at a lot of different areas. You can look at rivers, or population, or constants. You'll see that, the, that it's much more common to have a one than a two, two to three, three to four, and all these different areas. So what you can do is with these software tools is go into your company ERP system and plug in these sort of algorithms and say, hey, are there any numbers that don't fit this distribution? And then once you find that, you go ahead and take a closer look at those. All right, so hopefully this fraud chapter gave you some basic high-level views of what fraud is and how it occurs in organizations. And the key lesson here is that no one is immune to fraud. And you are not immune to fraud. Whether you are a manager or an employee, you should be thinking about how to minimize the chance that you yourself are going to fall into this kind of problem, as well as how to catch it in those that are around you as well. As we go through the chapter, we'll talk about more concrete elements here about uh, working with fraud in computer systems.